we have prayed. Shall we be seated? Our Father in heaven, I thank you for your people. People you have redeemed from the dark world into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. Father, we just sang that our anchor shall hold. I pray, O oh Lord, for all of us that our anchor shall hold indeed. In the name of Jesus, I ask, O oh Heavenly Father, by the mercies of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are not depending on ourselves, on our holiness, on our expertise, but we rely totally on the mercies of God. We shall not miss heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, we are taking an aspect of why we are here. Lead us, Holy Spirit. We hand over everything into your hands. We ask, O oh God, that you will speak to us. And blessed be your name, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Topic this evening is counseling for spiritual establishment. One more time, you are all welcome to this great congregation of the righteous. What does it mean to counsel? To counsel means to give advice. Simple. Give advice. It also means to guide. To guide someone who does not really know what to do. You guide the person. We find this in the book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 6. Proverbs, chapter 24, and verse 6. I read. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy work, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. Now, that last bit, which says, in a multitude of counselors there is safety, means then that when you have a number of righteous people guiding you on the right path, you will not miss it. That is what it means. You have a number of righteous men or women of God guiding you in the right path, you will not miss it in life. Praise the Lord. In Exodus chapter 18, verse 19, the Word of God says, Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with you. That is God speaking. Hearken unto my voice, and I will give you counsel, and God shall be with you. If you hearken unto wise counsel, God will be with you. But if you turn to the left and to the right and go the wrong way, you shall fall. That shall not be your portion. In the name of Jesus. Who is a counselor? I wish this was a class where I could ask questions. Who is a counselor? And receive answers. Praise the Lord. Anybody can be a counselor. A 
anybody. If you go to the man in the beer parlor, he wants to talk to somebody. And he thinks what he is telling that somebody is the best thing. So anybody can be a counselor. But is it every counsel from every counselor that is true counsel? A counselor can be a parent counseling the children. And if you don't counsel the children aright, <laughs> there will be a problem to you in the future. And should they, God forbid, go to hell, you, will, you cannot make it to heaven. When you leave lose your children and they go to hell, you can't make it to heaven either. So it is the duty of parents to counsel their children aright. Right? Wives can also be counselors. Now, when I said parents, let's look at the book of Proverbs. Proverbs again. Chapter 1. Open to the book of Proverbs, chapter 1. I will read two verses there. Verse 11 says, If any man say, Come with us. Sorry. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lock privily for the innocent without a cause. And then verse 15, my son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot <clears throat> from their path. That is a father's counsel to his son. He told his son, if we go back a little, you will see. In verse 10, it says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Who is speaking? A father speaking to his son. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come, come with us, let us lay wait for blood, let us love privily. For the innocent without a cause. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. I'm taking you here so you will know what it means to counsel. I said wives also counsel their husbands. A good wife counsels her husband aright. You know that Eve did not counsel his, I mean her husband aright. You all know. And so many women in scripture did not counsel their husbands aright. But let us see one woman that is almost of no consequence in the Bible. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. a story of when Jesus was about to be judged and condemned. In verse 19, I read, When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him 
saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. That woman dreamt and suffered so much because of Jesus Christ. And so he told the husband, don't have anything to do with that man, no. Leave him alone. He called him a just man. So that was good counsel. Although that woman today, nobody remembers her. But I took note because I was becoming perplexed. Why is it that many women in scripture counsel their husbands wrongly? What happened? So I took note of that. I also took note of Abigail. That she counseled her husband aright, except that the man wouldn't listen. But at least she did her part. She played her role well. Pastors counsel church members. Pastors and church workers like you and I. We counsel people. We talk to other church members, other ministry members. You are leaders. This meeting is for leaders. You are leaders. You counsel people. Indeed, it is your duty to counsel people. Because all of us cannot have the pulpit like our overseer here. He has always the pulpit. But not so all of us. And so the way you can do, play your role is counseling somebody. Pastors and church workers counsel. Some counsel people, of course, that will not be our portion. While most, to the glory of God, counsel people are right. Let's take an example of good counsel. Psalm 1 verse 1, which every one of us is conversant with. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor seated in the seat of discomfort. The person who does not listen to the counsel of an ungodly person is blessed. Are you hearing me? You can't live here and go and take counsel from an ungodly person. The Bible says it's when you refuse to take counsel from such a one, then you are blessed. What are the qualities of a good counselor? I told you earlier on that some people counsel people of course. But that is not how it's supposed to be. We are supposed to counsel people aright. So that while they were supposed to have gone astray by your counsel, they come on the right track. What are the qualities of a good counselor? Before I go to the qualities, I've shown you Psalm 1, verse 1. There is another counsel I want to show you. Second Samuel, verse 17. Let's go to Second Samuel, verse 17, and see something there. Are you there? Some of the Bible verses we read, if you don't know the background story, it may you may understand it just partially. So if you are taking down any Bible verses, after the fellowship, 
at your spare time, read the whole story and you will get to understand why that Bible verse was referred to in this meeting. Now, verse 7. It says, And Hushai said unto Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. Ahithophel was somebody who could hear God and give counsel and whatsoever he said came to pass. But when he derailed, God gave a little gap between him and Ahithophel. So on a certain day, he gave counsel and it was just as you have seen. They said, the counsel that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. Though he has been a good counselor, this time around, his counsel is not good. Why? Because he, he, he allowed himself to be drifted and God was no longer with him for a season. That will not be our portion in the name of Jesus Christ. Now I was talking about the qualities of a good counselor. Ordinarily, like I said, anybody wants to be a counselor. Anybody can claim, I know what to do, or what to say, what to, to teach. But it's not so. So as we look at some of the qualities, because we can't be exhaustive, particularly me, I can never be exhaustive. When the, am I permitted to call him the great man of God, comes, he will perfect that which I have left behind. Now, first of all, if you want to be a counselor, you must be saved. If you are an unsaved soul, don't counsel anybody because you are only leading that person astray. If you are not yet saved, don't wish to counsel anybody because talking about things of God, there is hardly anything you can counsel anybody on. Except if you are used of God like he used the ass. You know, there was a donkey in the Bible that God used to speak to somebody. Except if you are the donkey, in quote, that God wants to use. Yes, if God wants to use that kind of donkey, yes, he can use you. But ordinarily, no. Now. Number two. Know what is right. It's not the way you are thinking that is right at all times. What is the right thing according to scripture? What does God want on this thing that is before me for counseling? What is the, what is the Lord's mind? What is God's thinking on it? So before you open your mouth to talk to somebody, find out what God wants on that issue. So you must know the right thing before you counsel somebody. Many counselors say, let me pray about it. Have you heard that before? You go to a man of God, you lay your issue before him, you are expecting you know, some form of counsel. He will tell you, brother, sister, go, let me pray about it. That is very good. Because for you to counsel anybody on any topic, on any issue, on any subject, you must know what is right concerning that issue for you to properly counsel the person aright. Now, much more importantly, or equally importantly, as I have said, a counselor must be somebody 
who keeps secrets. Praise the Lord. If you are someone who runs mouth, anything you hear, the next person must hear. You cannot be a counselor in the house of God. I want to repeat that because it is very important. If you are someone who cannot keep another person's secret, because the things that come before you for counseling, some of these things, they are heavy to hear. I am not in the courtroom. But I can charge you for content. Please, every other person, either put your phone off or put them on silence. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, if you are someone who cannot, I want it to sink. That is why I stopped for a while. If you cannot keep secrets, you are not material for counseling. Withdraw yourself. If somebody walks up to you to say, brother, I have this problem, you say, okay, I cannot talk on it, but I will direct you to where you will receive good counsel. I want to repeat that as many times as I can. If you cannot keep secret, you are not a counselor. I think this is where women are most affected. Praise the Lord. Sister Josephine, hmm, do you know this sister like this that I thought is an angel? Do you know what happened? This is what I heard. This and this. This and this. Meanwhile, the sister has trusted you enough to open up to you for the sake of God. You are betraying her. Ah. And then the men. A sister, a brother, trusts you, tells you. Men, men are <coughs> better off. Because for men, they have the pulpit. Don't use somebody and finish the person on the pulpit. Men, are you awake? Please, when a sister confides in you and you come to the pulpit in your various uh, locations, don't finish the brother or the sister. The pulpit was given to you by God. Don't make it an occasion for offense. Because when the sister or the brother that has confided in you gets to know that, oh, I became a subject of preaching, that brother or sister will feel, this one doesn't have message. If nobody tells him a problem, he will not have what to come and preach. He is thriving on people's problems that they share with him. You see now, nobody will believe your message anymore. Praise the Lord. So, while some, uh, some issues, challenges, well, we call them problems, are good materials to use to... Uh, uh, let others know that they don't need to fall in the same problem that this one that came to you falls. You need to be discreet. You need to be careful to 
relay the message without making that person, assuming that person is in the congregation, without making the person feel somehow. I'm still feeling in my spirit that I still need to hammer on the sisters. You are leaders. Some of you are pastors' wives. Some of you are pastors yourselves, evangelists, ministers at various levels. People will definitely come to you. But can you really counsel as God has laid on your heart to talk to that one and then put it behind you? That is one thing I want you to take away with as you leave because that one is towards a fellow Christian. Other things that the men of God are teaching us here is for our souls. It's for us to be firm Christians, mature Christians, mature ourselves and uh, talk about going to heaven. But this one is service to people. And if you don't work on yourself, you will affect so many people negatively. Some will leave this ministry because of you. So it's very important. Don't drive the little, the few we have been, God has helped to gather. Don't drive. When somebody comes to you with a problem, counsel that person and let the next person not hear. Praise the Lord. Another quality of a good counselor is integrity. Integrity. If all of you here know that this brother works in so 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 office and his ways are not right but he is always forward in things of God uh, you know that uh, you will not have confidence to go to him for counseling because you don't believe in who he is integrity integrity in the way you speak integrity in the way you behave whether somebody is there or not in the secret of your dwelling place can God vouch for you <laughs> can God say that this one no matter what happens he or she is my son. Let's go to the book of Job. Satan, has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewed evil. See, you know the devil is called the accuser of the brethren in the book of Revelation. God could tell the devil to his face, Has thou 
considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth. That means the whole world. No one is as upright as Job. And God was telling the devil. And you know if it was not true, the devil will say, Ah, God, you don't, you don't understand. I saw him doing this and that. I hope you know that. If God was not telling the truth, the devil would have protested. Did he protest? God said, There is none like him in the earth. A perfect and an upright man one that feareth God and estueth evil. He fears God. He runs away from evil. Integrity. Are you somebody who runs, who can run away from evil? I was talking to my little boy in the house. He's uh, just Oh, he was 10 yesterday. So, we I shared with him. And he asked me a question. And I had to... I, while explaining, I said, you turned 10 today. That was yesterday. You turned 10 today. Yes, you ate the chicken. But there is something I want to tell you. Because we were at the prayer altar. So he asked me a question. And in answering the question, I told him, when you are in school and children are playing, are saying something that you know that if me, because he's a child, is me I can use as an example. If you know that if I come and I see these children or I hear them saying these type of things and I will not be happy with them because Jesus will not be happy with these things and you are there with them. You are not yet saved. Because that 10 year old behaves like a mature Christian. So I told him, that you are not yet saved. So he asked me, so what should he do? I said, the moment you hear them say something that is ungodly, either leave the place, tell them this is not right, and when they are not stopping, leave them the place and make sure they are no more your friends. In your various places of work, in your homes, in your uh, places where you do business, the people you relate with, the things you discuss, the things you do together, are they things that glorify God? Can you be entrusted with money? I think that is where many people fail. In a ministry like this, there are people in Gombe, people in Damaturu, people in, in, in Mina. We, are, we have them in Portacot, our members. Now, our overseer has chosen somebody to be in charge of the Portacot brethren. Another person is in charge of Gombe brethren, Mina brethren. Makodi brethren, Hilarin brethren. Sometimes there is need for money to be put together. And then you are in charge of these finances. How do you handle this thing? Praise the Lord. See, that is where they know that somebody is a believer. It is not for us women. It is not that we removed our earring. That's not it too. For you men, it is not that you are carrying your Bible and saying praise the Lord. This is how they know that somebody is a believer. That thing that nobody can know 
and you alone are there. <laughs> Can you say, God, are my, my hands are clean? Everybody lift your hands to the Lord. Lord, my hands are clean. Say it. Praise the Lord. If you are entrusted with some substance, can you say, Lord, that is, in your room, lock the door. Nobody is there with you. And tell him, Lord, my hands are clean. I did not touch this thing. Can you say it? Most of our chapter brethren are men. That is why I'm facing here. Can you say, Lord, my hands are clean with the money entrusted in your hand? God told us, Jesus told us, you cannot serve two masters, God and Mammon. Most of us don't even know who Mammon is. Mammon is the God of money. His name is Mammon. So Mammon is not just a word. He is a God. He is a personality. The God of money is called Mammon. So you can't serve God and Mammon. Wherever you are, what chapter, what uh, portfolio, whatever is committed into your hands, faithfulness is required. I think that is found in um, Second Corinthians. Let me see. Uh, The Bible says, moreover, it is expected of a steward that a man be found faithful. That's where I'm looking for. Is it Second Corinthians? Or is it first? Second. Is it first Corinthians? Okay, not second. Yes. First Corinthians chapter four verse two. Somebody should read. A man. A man should stand up and read. Stewards, stewards in the vineyard of God, all of us here, me and all of you. And the chief steward is this gentleman sitting here. That's the chief steward for this ministry. All of us are sub stewards. Our brother has just read to us. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Whatever is committed into your hands, diligence and faithfulness. Be faithful. Closely related with faithfulness is loyalty. Let me tell you the difference. Some of you know, but I know there may be one or maybe two people that do not know the difference. Faithfulness is being straight. Whatever. Mm -mm, I won't do this wrong thing. Like the example I've given concerning money. You account for every cobble. Don't say this change is only 50 naira. This one, okay, I can. I just took this 50 naira and bought uh, pure water. That 50 naira, <laughs> you will be surprised. One day it might be required of you from the Lord. Don't touch it. Don't 
touch it. Don't touch it. Be faithful to the least cover. Loyalty is a little bit different from faithfulness. Loyalty means when you live here, as we are here, all of us are happy, happy, happy. We are in the same ministry. We are all one. We, we seem to, seemingly, we are one. But when you live here, it, whatever they are doing in that place, self, I, I don't understand. I don't understand. Though. You are not lawyer. I don't, I don't even understand what they are doing there. You go there, uh, they are always like this. You do this one, it's not okay. You do that one. I don't even understand them more. Oh, you are not lawyer. Am I understood? Loyalty means if there is something you don't understand, meet the man of God. Good enough. Our number has is not too large for him to handle. We are few enough for him to handle. You don't understand something, seek to understand. Don't speak evil of this ministry. Don't say something uncomely about this ministry. That is not loyalty. I know that if, if I tell this sister that I don't even know why they did this one like that. I thought that it should be like this, and they did it like this. And I have sown a seed inside her. One day, when she too has something she didn't quite understand, she will now connect with what I told her. She will say, it's not only me. This is how other people too are not satisfied with what is going on. You are scattering the brethren. You are scattering. Let me see what God said about scattering. I don't know whether it's Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 6. Let's go there. Are you there? I'm supposed to read from verse 16 to verse 19. But I will first of all read verse 19. Then I will come back to start all over again from verse 16. Well, to, under, to be well understood. Let me read 16 and 19. Praise the Lord. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. If, no, but verse 19 now. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Somebody who makes, knocks people's head. So, give, going by the example I gave, if I tell this sister that everything that is being done here is not okay, for the moment, she might try to say, no, sister, it's not like that. Oh, and this is this, this is that. But later, should she feel somehow, I have already sown a seed of discord in her heart. She, it will now germinate and catch fire and blow. You are not being loyal to the ministry. In that state, you cannot properly counsel somebody within us here that brings an issue to you. A good counselor must have integrity. 
An unfaithful servant does not have integrity. A disloyal servant does not have integrity. Praise the Lord. Chapter 20. Are you there? Verse 20. We read verse 20 to verse 23. And they watched him. They watched him. They watched Jesus. And sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men. They feign themselves to be just men, to be upright men, to be correct men. They sent forth spies who feigned themselves as just men, that they might take hold of his word, that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest that and teacheth rightly, neither accepted thou the person of any, but teacher the way of God truly. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? But he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Praise the Lord. In verse 20, this, it is written, And they watched him. Whom did they watch? Jesus. People are watching you. They are watching you. If you are pretending to be rapturous, you are pretending to be righteous, you are pretending to be holy, you are pretending to be a man of God, a woman of a woman of God, pastors who are pretending in one way or the other, they are watching you. The Bible says they watched him. And after watching Jesus and watching and watching, they now came to him with a fake problem. Should we pay tribute to Caesar or not? It's not that they didn't know what to do. But they came to tempt him. Jesus himself knew that they have come to tempt him. He said, why tempt ye me? They are watching you. People are watching you. Especially now that you have left the ways of your former church and you are because you have become a holy sanctified child of God. They are watching you. How much different is is he from us? How much different is she from us? They are watching you. Particularly we, the ladies, once you remove earring, everybody sees you with suspicion. Ah, is, is, is she now more spiritual than us? Is she claiming to be more spiritual than us? Does it mean the rest of us are going to have hell and only she is going to heaven? They are watching you. They will definitely come with an issue maybe genuine, maybe false, like these ones did to Jesus. Jesus just promptly asked them, why tempt you me? Why are you tempting me? You know the answer. You are just asking to see what I will say. Praise the Lord. A good counselor must be a man of integrity. Let them know you for your integrity. I was watching a video clip on my phone. A man, I will give you this testimony now. A man was 
had no job, his family was suffering, they had no food, the children, nothing, nothing, nothing. And so this man went out to look for a job. And he knocked on a door. The man was inside, the orga of the of the organization was inside. He said, yes, come in. He came in. He said, Sir, I have come to look for a job. And the man said, Okay, we are already looking for somebody like you. You are welcome. You are welcome. The job is yours almost immediately. But you have to do this assignment for me first. Then I will give you the appointment letter. The man was very happy. He said, I am expecting a consignment. Um, the, 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 the cargo contains um, 19 uh, boxes. Take your pen and write 15. And then, you know, go and count them, put in the, the necessary documentation, but put 15. The man said, but we are expecting 19. He said, yes, we are expecting 19. Um, you see, ju just do what I say, put 15. And the man got up. You could see the way he was walking out of that place. He was not happy. He left. When he got home, he told the wife, they are actually looking for somebody like me. But the way the man started, I don't think I can work in that organization. He said, ah, what is it? You know how we have not been eating in this place. Eh? We, we don't have food. And now you have gotten a job. You have come without your righteousness. Uh, we are suffering, you see. That man is the owner of the business. If he says you should cancel three and uh, four and write uh, 15, do it. The man thought. He said, no, I will not do that because that's not the only place I will work for the rest of my life. By the time I live here and I'm used to this, it will not be accepted elsewhere. But he said all this in his mind. The woman did not. The woman thought she had told. I told you women hardly give good counsel. I plead with you. We are good women of God. We will give good counsel. In the name of Jesus. The woman said, no, we have been suffering. Let us just take the job first. Then later you can... After you've entered in sin, how will you come out? So the man, the man left the woman alone. He left the wife alone and went the next day. Because the man said if he has made up his mind and has agreed to his terms, he should come back. So when he went there the next day, he told the, the man, said, have you agreed? He welcomed him very happily and heartily. <laughs> yes, uh, welcome. Have you agreed to my terms? Yes, yeah, sit down, sit down and fill the form if you have agreed. The job is yours. Fill the form. The man sat down with and sighed and said, Unfortunately, sir, I only came to tell you that I, I have lost the job. I have missed the job. The man was like, uh -uh. I'm saying I'm giving you the job. You haven't missed it. I will give you the job. He said, what you said I should do, I can't do it. So I'm a Christian. I don't do that. So I'm very, very sorry. As he will rise up from the seat, all along there was somebody at the door. I don't know what that person is. He was just there. As he would rise and leave, the man at the door looked at the ogre and did head like this to him. And the, the ogre, whether it's proper ogre or is made up ogre for the purpose of this, I don't know. Because it's the man at the door there that signaled to this one like this. And he called him back. He called the man back and said, 
you have the job. It was a test, and that is your only interview you have passed. The man could not believe. He was going home sorrowful. But you see, that video clip does not show what he went and told, how he ended it with the wife. Look at that kind of counsel. You know he would have lost that job if he agreed with his wife to come and tell the man that, yes, I have agreed to write 15 in the stead of 19. He would have lost that job, right? Praise the Lord. Integrity. Maintain your integrity. Integrity is... There is no substitute. There is a verse of scripture I have been searching my mind. The Bible says, If you cannot take good care of what belongs to another man, who will give you your own? Can we get there? Let me look for it. Twelve. Luke sixteen twelve. Are you in nine? The twelve. Mm. Is it eleven and twelve? Yeah, but I'm talking about twelve now. Read it, sir. So can you read it to the hearing of everybody? Luke sixteen twelve. So let everybody. All right. Praise the Lord. And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Something that belongs to someone else is committed into your hands. Take good care of it. <laughs> Take good care of it. If you want your own to come, oh, if you don't want your own, then pinch from this one. Ah, God is faithful. God is faithful. Something that belongs to another man, you need to take care of that one more than your own. If this dress, this is my dress, I can afford to drop it here and go and then later come back to look for it. Oh, where is this my dress that is here? Fan has blown it to that side. If she gives me her own jacket, I am not permitted to keep it here and go somewhere, only to come back here to look for it. The one she gave me, I should hold it wherever I'm going. Praise the Lord. That is it. You have to be more careful with that which belongs to another man, even much more than your own. Didn't the Bible say that you should esteem others more than you? Philippians chapter 2. I 
Are we there? Verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, let each person esteem another person better than himself. So as we are seated here, me, I see all of you better than me. That is what God expects. For that reason, I gave you the example I gave. If I can drop my dress here, it's my own. It doesn't matter when I go yawo, when I come back, I'll pick my dress and shake it, shake the dust off it, hang on myself and continue. But if she gives me her dress to hold this dress for me, I'm coming. I am not permitted to drop it on the ground, then go everywhere, then come back and pick it. No! I'm supposed to hold it tenaciously and make sure no dust touches it. Meanwhile, I did that to my own. Praise the Lord. When you cannot do these things, your Christianity is still in kindergarten level. Despite that, we have removed the earrings. You must learn to esteem other people more than you. You must learn to be faithful to things committed into your hands, whether that person is there or not. You must be a man of integrity if you must counsel a right. Next is the subject matter of counseling. What you are told to counsel people on. What the person presents be before you. I mentioned that earlier. Is it your area? It's not everybody that can counsel on everything. You are not a jack of all trades. A master of none. No. Is it an area? Is it a terrain you are conversant with? If not... That is the best time to say, give me time to pray. There is the place of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that will help you to counsel aright. Walk closely with the Holy Spirit. Ask him per time. This individual, you know the issues he has mentioned to me, you know them better. Use me, speak through me. You, Holy Spirit, is you who can talk to this person. Speak through me and let me say what is the right thing to be said for the hour. Praise the Lord. Now, the person sitting before you, asking you for counsel, Maybe he's totally strange. He's a stranger to you. Maybe you've never met him before. He's new. But I want you to know one thing and be fast at it. There are categories of people. Four. All human beings are divided into four. The whole world. You have cholerics. You have phlegmatics. You have melancholics and you have sanguines. If you are counseling a choleric, you must humble yourself. Otherwise, the choleric will think, what is she thinking? Or he, is he thinking that he is better than me? So you must humble yourself in counseling him. He doesn't know, he doesn't know that thing. That is why he came to you. Yet, there is a way you will talk. The choleric will start feeling somehow. 
That is his nature. Praise the Lord. That is how God made him. So you must beware of the kind of person you are counseling. If he is a choleric, if he is a sanguine, a sanguine, you must learn to drum the thing you are telling him into his mind. Because they can't concentrate for too long. There are people who are always hey, 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 hey. fast, 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 fast. Everything about them is on the fast lane. So you you will ensure by yourself to drum it to drive your point across to them. A melancholic easily gets gets hot. You may say something and the melancholic will feel condemned. He is someone who easily gets withdrawn. So while that person is sitting before you, you will do your math quick, 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 quick. What kind of person is this? And you know how to position yourself. When I am counseling a choleric, I become nothing before him. But what I'm saying makes sense to him. Praise the Lord. So, if you are counseling a phlegmatic, know that this is somebody who, do, who doesn't get moved by anything. If you like, let the thunder be breaking the ceiling. He is not moved. So, you will find a way of make, ensuring that you are carrying him or her along with you. Praise the Lord. the aged if you are counseling and a very old person you also know that this one is not on the same frequency with you what he will understand is not the, your language as a young person it's even different from his own so you know how to upgrade yourself to his level or her level I, let me tell you what happened in court one day. We had to adjourn a case. And we were in January. I adjourned the case to April. So this learned senior advocate got up and said, My Lord, me, I'm 72 years old. This one that you adjourned this case to April, I don't even know whether I still have many days to reach April. <laughs> ah, I felt so sad for him. So what I did was, I told him that, Sir, I would like to see you after sitting. So if you leave the courtroom and come back, you can come back when I rise. On a second thought, I said, no, this man is very old. He is 72. If he leaves and goes very far, he may not come back. He may be tired. So I just told the remaining people in the court, excuse me, and I rose. I told them him to pass around and enter my chamber. He came and I ministered Christ to him. That was very, I thought this man may have sensed, you know the elder, elders, sometimes they sense that my time is up. And so I thought he sensed that his time is up. So I administered Christ to him. I told him, after he, he I told him about Jesus Christ, I told him his saving grace. He wanted to argue. <clears throat> he wanted to argue. He wanted to say that he is of the Anglican faith and that he goes to church regularly. I said, well, I'm not talking about church now. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the Savior. I'm talking about salvation. Are you saved? Are you redeemed? Are you sanctified? That is, that has nothing to do with your congregation, your church. And to my surprise, this man 
did not know that somebody needs to be saved. He just knew that he had, when you, you are going to church regularly, you are a child of God. You, just, you have to go to church regularly. We had a long talk. I took him through scripture. The Bible says this. Is it, do you see it as true or as false? He said it's true. Now, listen, that is a counsel appearing before me. In the court setting, the judge is like semi-god. But this man started calling me my daughter. I didn't know. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. I did. I had to do for him what we do in our churches. I opened to Romans chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, and told him that the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that which you believe, now you have told me you didn't know before, now you have known. Do you believe these things we have gone through? He said, if I don't believe, then I must be a fool. I said, Kai, yes, this man, elderly man. He said, uh, I now said, okay, the Bible says, if you believe as you have told me you believe now, say it with your mouth. And I took him to Revelation. Jesus said he is knocking at your door. You have to open for him to come in. And I said, invite him consciously. Tell him, come into my heart and take over me and rule me. I said all those things. This man bowed down his head and prayed. To my amazement, one small tear fell down his, his eye. But we are not allowed to mingle with them. I want to follow up that man and I'm unable. Because the system does not allow me to be seen with him. So, sir, I would like you to give me somebody I will link up with this man. He is still alive. Thank you, sir. He is still alive. He didn't die. So in April, when he now came for the case, I asked him, I said, sir, you are still here handling this case. He just did like a child. He said, <laughs> ah, he did like, you know, in fact, even as if he's a woman, he just did something like this. <laughs> And so the case has been going on. But I can't ask him about his, his uh, pro spiritual growth because if I keep telling him, come and see me, come and see me, the counsel on the other side will feel suspicious. This which they are always calling her, you calling this man, you know. So that is why I said, if I come here today, I will ask for somebody to help me follow up this man. He will make heaven in Jesus' name. Yeah. Counselors, I'm addressing counselors. The next thing is the status of the person you are counseling. How you will counsel a, a, somebody who maybe is even an applicant job seeker. He finished school. He has not even gotten a job. It's different from when you are counseling a senator. Praise the Lord. You won't use the same language. You will only use the same scripture. But the way of speech is different. You will comport yourself in such a manner, not talking carelessly, in such a manner that he, in his thought, he will elevate you. He will say, ah, this small boy like this, this young man like this, this old woman like this, I thought she doesn't know anything. He will lift you in his heart and have good regard for you. And for that uh, little 
child or young man that is even yet to marry, yet to get a job, yet there are things you counsel him to make him become a big person in life. So counseling the young person and counseling, I mean, the status of the individual is not the same. Praise the Lord. These are things you will consciously want to know and ask God to teach you. The next is gender. And this is where I want to talk to the men. When you are counseling, whether this person you are counseling a male is a male or a female, is what you should bear to have at the back of your mind. If the person is a female, be warned as you stand here now. If the person you are counseling is a female, be warned. Be warned. I have a, a pastor friend. She's a female pastor. When she's counseling somebody, she will never look at your face. She will always look above your head. Even though she's facing you. I'm talking to you. But this is how she looks. So, my brother, see, on this issue, this is how God will have you to do it. Are you, did you notice that I'm not looking at you? This is how God will have you to do it. God loves you. He will not allow you to fall into this temptation. He will uphold you. He will uphold you. I say he will uphold you. You are saying amen. Amen. Her eyes will never meet with your own eyes. Whether you are a woman or a man, she is not bothered. This great woman of God. That is because the world has gone sour. Before Pastor Rika stopped us from seeing uh, Bumilayo Adebayo, that woman had a lot to tell about the dark kingdom. The world has gone sour. It is not a lie. We see it on a daily basis. Excuse me, sir. The young lady you met in my house, one, yes, mm -mm. that one that you said looks like that picture, one, one girl, a smallish, fair-skinned girl, can't remember, we discovered that she is a witch. I sent her out of my house. We discovered she is a witch. The world has gone sour. If you are a man and you are counseling a woman and you are dilly dally, by the time she puts something in her eye, you just look at her, your Christianity is gone. Be very careful. include women. You are counseling a sister. Watch. I know my sisters. That In that area we are better than you. Oh yes. Even if we talk more than you, in that area we are better than you. We are very sensitive. Any of these sisters here, if they are counseling a lady and the lady is a witch, they will know. You people, you won't know. You will be dead, 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 dead until something happens. That won't be your portion. Uh -huh. My sisters, they will know. I'm telling you the truth. They will know immediately that this sister, uh -uh, she's not okay. If we live here, if you talk to some of them, they may give you experiences that they have come across. It's you. So be careful when you are counseling a woman. 
I wrote here, understand that women are dangerous. <laughs> Let's see what Colossians is telling us. Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 5. Colossians 3, 5. Praise the Lord. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Mortify your body. The Bible says our body, they are the members of the, we are the members of the body of Christ. So, the Bible is telling us to be dead to sin. All those sins named there is telling us to be dead to them. Mortify means be dead to sin. If you are counseling a woman, be a little bit, you know, let her notice, to know that you didn't notice anything good in her. If she is beautiful, you, you didn't see. Make it obvious. Praise the Lord. Let it be obvious. Let her see that you didn't notice her. You are only interested in what she, uh, she has told you and how best we can solve that problem. You, you, you are less concerned about who she is, what she looks like. <clears throat> Make it a conscious thing that she should know that you didn't notice. From there, you will notice that if she wants you to notice, she too will do it consciously. Then you will now notice. You will notice that she is consciously making herself to do, they call it, notice me. <laughs> so if she is doing notice me, you will now know at that time. If you are a man of God seated here and you are married, if women are always coming to you for counseling, it may help you if your, if your wife stays by you. Praise the Lord. I once had a pastor who, who, who is a sanguine by nature. I told you before, sanguines take almost everything for granted. There are people who are always happy. There are people who are always confident. There are people who, who are always on the go. I think as I'm describing, you will know one or two people like that. They, they, they are always on the go. Everything goes with the sanguine. Everything goes. He trusts anybody. He trusts anybody, he believes everything is something, doesn't even suspect that something could be wrong. Praise the Lord. So if you are, uh, I had this pastor who was a sanguine, and here is a woman, the wife, was a staunch choleric. So the pastor's office was inside. Her own office was outside. When you come and you are a lady and you are seeking counsel, she will first of all interview you, hear the problem, and talk with you and tell you, okay, let us go and see the man of God. It is not always like that. 
But this man knew his peculiar weaknesses. Um, praise the Lord. This man knew his peculiar weaknesses, and he felt he he agreed with his wife that it should be like that, and it helped him. It was difficult for any woman to get across to him. You know, just two of us, me and you. No, it was very, very difficult. So if any woman called, hello, sir, uh, you know, called the secretary, I want an appointment with, with uh, the pastor, uh, the secretary will pass that booking to the wife. It was a law for them, for his sake, because he is a sanguine. You all know that uh, David in the Bible was a sanguine. He would just, when he sees anybody, he would, ah, David, Jehovah is Lord. He could fall for any woman. Is it not so? After Bathsheba, didn't he fall for Abigail? Where there are no girls for David to go and marry, must you marry somebody's widow? Huh? They were girls. But because he is a sanguine, everything, sanguines don't think too deeply like that. Hey, this thing is good. Pam, <laughs> it goes. Praise the Lord. So, my, this, my pastor, knew that he is a sanguine. So, he put this in check on himself. People didn't, some, should I say, I don't know about the men, but some ladies complained, if you don't want, don't go. The shikena, babi. <laughs> so, it, uh, that was his own check. I also recommend some form of check on you, on you gentlemen, because the world has gone sour. Women are now very, very terrible. So when you are counseling girls, take heart. Bear in mind that uh, you are on danger zone. If you don't take time, your Christianity will end there. That won't be your portion. Mm -hmm. uh, I also recorded here that you should train your wife to... Uh, you know, I re you remember I mentioned earlier that women talk. So if you train your wife not to be a talker, you can counsel somebody together with her. Particularly when that person is a woman. You can counsel somebody together with her. Praise the Lord. I think this is all I have for now except... If there are questions, I will take. Where I cannot, our overseer is here to help me. And many other men of God. I saw one at the back there. When I was sitting at the back. So, are there questions? Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for the wonderful teaching. And um, the question I want to ask is about keeping secrets. Um, as a pastor, when an issue comes to you, that you know that this thing is delicate for you to handle alone, can you share with someone that is, I mean, um, higher than you, maybe to advise on how to advise the, advise the person better, or what should you do? Because I had an experience like that. Okay. I I don't know details, but I think you, there are empty seats here. You can sit nearby just in case I am not going the way uh, you expected. You will clarify because I didn't quite get what you mean. If you are in a setting, that is, 
ministry setting and uh, somebody comes to share a challenge with you and that thing is personal to the person to the individual that shared with you there will be nothing wrong if in that setting you have a superior pastor or brother for you to say this is it because after all you are working under that person is it not so i mean from uh, did i understand you correctly you are working under that one so it's as good as that question having been posed to the that your superior so there is nothing wrong in taking the matter to your superior if you cannot answer the question you cannot solve the matter yourself you take it to the superior you see it even in scripture they uh, they came to the disciples they couldn't solve their problem they took it to jesus and jesus said it is lack of faith that you were unable to solve the problem <laughs> but i know that is not it's not issue of lack of faith it's just growth growth stage you will grow to a point when you can handle all problems praise the lord so did i answer you uh -huh. yes Ma, please, I couldn't get the, the four kinds of human beings to say we have and their characteristics. Okay. The first is, I am the one classifying them, him, the first, is the choleric. The choleric, the characteristics is like this. is somebody who is bossy by nature. That is how God made him. It's not his fault. He is a boss. He believes to always be in charge. And he, he has no time for mediocrity. He is a leader by nature. That's the choleric. Eh? The next, um, let me take the phlegmatic. The phlegmatic is a little bit on... I don't care kind of thing. He is hardly offended. No matter what you do, he is not angry. And when he tells you one word, it will chook you and eh? you will never forget. He may not even know that he, he, what he has said to you is painful to you. While you are there knocking your head, he, is, uh, he has said he has said. The next is uh, the sanguine. That's the one I gave as an example of David. He's always on the move. He's always excited. Very, very vibrant. He is always... Uh, 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 if a sanguine offends you, he doesn't take it to heart. If you offend him, he easily forgives. He will forgive you and move on with life. Life is always moving on with a sanguine. He doesn't do anything with, with uh, perfection. Everything is done. Zip, 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 zip. He is finished. Whether it's good, whether it's not good, now your trouble. He is less concerned. Yet, he feels you should commend me. I've done it. I've done what you said I should do. You should praise me. He doesn't want to know whether he did it well or not. Are you? Have you got that one? Then the the last one is the melancholic. The melancholic is uh, a a withdrawn kind of person. Easily feels slighted. Easily feels. He always thinks of himself low. So if you put him low, you put him too down. You know, he, lo he sees himself as a low person. Because of that, he's not confident in himself. 
because of that, he does everything to perfection because he, he is never okay. He always feels he's not yet okay now. Mm? Let's clean here a little more. Why the same way we come and just do hand like this here? Yeah. Whether there is still dust or not, he has finished his going. The melancholic will clean and clean and clean and clean everywhere. He will still be feeling, oh, by the time it comes, he will still notice it's not, he will clean again and again. You know, so the melancholic aims at perfection and takes himself very, very, very low. So when you are counseling them, you take, because he is low, if you do something small, he might feel hurt. Praise the Lord. Is that clear? Yes, I saw one hand here. Yeah. Or oh, was it that same question? All right. Are we done? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I have a question, ma. Yeah. If you have a pastor mm. that is uh, unteachable, huh? the pastor that doesn't take advice okay. from the flock, mm. he finds out that he is over everybody yes. because the church or the pew is under him yes. and he used the authority of the pulpit and be dishing out courses to the member mm. to the flock in that case what would you what would you do how do you approach the pastor and solve the problem praise the lord hallelujah very simple god did not place you above any pastor he is the sub shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. Your pastor is the sub shepherd. We saw this in the relationship between David and Saul. Saul was not a good man of God for God. Eh? David was the good man of God. But Saul was there before David and David told us that God forbid that he should stretch forth his hand against the anointed man of God so we take a clue from there that your pastor is the sub shepherd so if he is doing wrong things and he is not listening to everybody it means for the privilege that you are there, God has given you an assignment. It means you will fast and pray for that man of God. I can't tell you what I do. If I tell you, I may be blowing my trumpet. So I will not tell you. God has, if you have something like that, God has called you into a ministry which you will be blessed. Because by the time you pray for a man of God, blessings will certainly be for you. It may not be blessings of this world, but God will never allow you to go to hell. Anything that will drift you from Christianity, God will ensure that he takes care of it so that you don't go to hell. Praise the Lord. If you are in that condition, God is giving you a job. You will fast. He won't even need to know. You fast and pray for him. Pray for him. All those areas. He doesn't hear. Lord, take control. He doesn't do this. He, he is pompous. Father, bless him with the spirit of humility. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I think we finished answering the questions. Did I answer you well? <laughs> That's the only thing. You have no option at all to come and say you want to talk to a, a, a foolish thing. And I told him. <laughs> when he wanted to counsel me, he said, if you were not a mommy, if you were not mommy, I would have said so. But because you are money, I won't say anything. But I got the message. I got the message. I got the message. I was properly counseled in one sentence. One sentence. I got the message. I won't do that foolish thing next time. 
Praise the Lord. Well, if he lies, I permit him. He can tell you the foolishness I did. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Can we put our hands together for Jesus Christ? Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Is anybody blessed?